Life choices. Life choices. Psalms 51. The book of Psalms, chapter 51 and verse 10. 51 verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a right spirit within me. Okay. This is David writing to the... Well, it was a song, I should say. Uh, expressing himself to the Heavenly Father, saying, To create in me a what? A, a right spirit. Or create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a right spirit within me. So, David was saying, asking the Father to... I'm sorry, what's my place? Create in me a clean heart. Create in me a clean heart. The heart is the mind, everybody knows that, right? If anybody doesn't know, show me by show of hands that the heart is the mind. All right. I don't know where I had to start this. Every one of us are going to have to make decisions in our life on what direction we want to take our life. Who do you want to be? Who do you want to be known as? Uh, what is our legacy? Now, when David said this, he said, create me a clean heart, meaning a clean mind. Nobody knows what goes on in people's mind. You don't know what's going on in my mind. I don't know what's going on in your mind. But the Lord governs our hearts. He knows what's going on in our, in our mind. So David, evidently, heart or his mind was unclean. So let's read it again. Psalms chapter 51 verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. So he's asking God to renew. Give me back that spirit that I once had. Renew that spirit back in me. I'm going to tell you, all of us either have or will be there one day when you're going to have to make some real life choices, real, real big decisions, you're going to have to really be honest with yourself of who you are, who do you want to be seen as. I mean, honestly be seen as, not the fake person that a lot of us put out there sometimes, but the real person. But he's asking the Father that I need you to renew that spirit in me. I mean, sometimes that spirit leaves you. Now, the problem is when it does leave you, are you honest that you have a struggle or are you lying to yourself? That's why I tell you every year, I see people come around, take pictures or whatever, and sometimes, you know, I'm just talking to the captain about it. Sometimes you can look at people and, for the most part, know that they have joy in this truth. Who, is, who of you have never expressed that when you first heard this thing, you just was like on fire? When you've heard it and believed, I should say. You was on fire. You just, you know, your thought process was just scripture, scripture, scripture. Then you kind of like, you might hit a little roadway like this. To get a little wavy. But he's asking, read it one more time. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Now, how do you create, how do you act, how would you get a clean heart or a clean mind? What would you have to be doing, first of all? What cleans you? I just gave you the answer. Come on, young man. Keeping the laws of God. Do you have a scripture that can explain that? All right, somebody help me. Um, Zion. Ephesians 5:26. Let's go. The book of Ephesians, the fifth chapter, the 26th verse. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26. That he might sanctify and cleanse it. With the washing of water by the word. So if it, it, it is the really, I'm sorry. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. The it is you. If you want to cleanse your mind, it's going to be by the washing of the water. The word. This is not, that's why I said, you know, I'm going to take a jab at Christianity again. They, they have this thing like they'll dip you in water and like it makes you clean. It'll clean your exterior right here. But it doesn't clean this. 
So your outside will be nice and zestfully clean, but in here will be full of corruption, of lust, of hatred. The only way to clean this would be by this. So when he said, Lord, create in me a clean heart, I can tell you one thing, if you don't study, you're not gonna get a clean heart. You gotta actually open a book and read on how to clean the mind. I hope you understand it. The Bible closed, you're going to be sinning. The Bible open and apply, you'll be okay. So let's go back. Let's go back to Psalms 51 and 10. Psalm chapter 51 verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Put that right spirit back in me, Lord. I need it back again. Help me get right. Read on. Cast me not away from thy presence. Here's the scary part now. If you're not doing this, he's asking the Lord, listen, don't cast me away because the Lord will get to a point where he will cast you away from his presence. When he begins to cast you away from your presence, there's some identifying signs. Here's a few of them. The person, if they're in the Bible, they become withdrawn. They don't understand scriptures like they used to. They can't explain simple things. Their spirit is easily uh, what's what, provoked. They can't rule their spirit. I say, you know, God is not governing them. Now, sometimes when you're young in the truth, you have to learn that. But when you get up in age in this truth, you gotta, you, once you, for me, once you get past three solid years, real years of serving the Lord, this, you, you should be at a certain point where you could kind of, for the most part, taper off. But he's saying what? We did again? Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. And that's the point. When does that happen? We just read. He was saying, create in me a new heart. That means there's something going on in your mind that I can't see. Or you and me, you can't see. But at that point, if you don't fix that, God will get to take his spirit away from you. We read that earlier in Wisdom of Solomon 1. God, this is not like school book. Like one plus one is two, you understand it stuff. This is spiritual, what you understand today don't mean you're gonna understand it next year. God will remove the spirit from you. You all understand that? So in the meanwhile, while you have that stuff bouncing around your head, it's to your best advantage or my best advantage for us to be honest with it, fix it, or he will begin to depart from you. Let's read that in Wisdom of Solomon again. Wisdom of Solomon. Chapter 1, verse 4, or verse 3. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 3. For forward thoughts separate from God. So sinful thoughts, something that's outside of the scriptures, will separate you from God. And his power, when it is tried, reproveth the unwise. For and, it, and his power, when it's tried, will reprove the unwise. You know what it means? Tried, meaning you know something is wrong and you're still doing it. God is saying, you keep on trying me, I'm going to reprove you. So he's giving us a chance to fix it. In many cases, it gives us a lot of chances. What happens is that when we get that chance, we think we got away with it. It's like, you're an idiot. You eventually, I'm going to eventually embarrass you. And if, say, you get away with it for the rest of your life, the day will come when you will answer to him. Or I will answer to him. Read on. Verse 4. For into a malicious soul, Wisdom shall not enter. What? For into a malicious soul, wisdom shall not enter, nor dwell in the body that is subject unto sin. For into a malicious soul, wisdom cannot enter. If you have a, a malicious spirit, God's wisdom will not enter into you. That's why I always say, when you deal with religion or church or pastors, I'm like, the wisdom of God cannot be upon him. I don't care if he got 40,000 people sitting in his church. If he has a Christmas tree behind him, there's no way God is dealing with him. I know he might sound good, but you can handle him in the scriptures. Just take him to the laws of God. He will buckle. Wisdom cannot enter. God said his wisdom will not enter into a body that is subject unto sin. Nor it will dwell or, or be in a body that is a subject. A subject means you are servant to sin. Sin controls you. Life choices. Who are you going to serve? The God of this Bible or Satan? Yes. Verse 5. Hold first. Nor dwell in a body subject to sin. 
I have you holding what else? Psalms 51? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Just hold Psalms 51. Hold this. Let's go to 1 Samuel uh, 16. No, dwell. 1 Samuel 16. That's it. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 14. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. Now watch this. God's Spirit will leave you. Read on. And an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Now, an evil spirit now will enter into you. So the Lord is going to say, one or two things are going to be inside of you. It's either going to be my spirit, or I'll leave and I'll let an evil spirit take you over. But it ain't going to be both of us there. You all understand it? So now, what is governing your thoughts? What is governing your action? Is it God? Or is something evil governing you? That's why they would say, renew to me the joy of thy salvation. Create in me a clean heart. Don't remove your presence, don't, don't remove your presence from me. Let's go back to Wisdom of Solomon. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 4. For into a malicious soul, wisdom shall not enter, nor dwell in the body that is subject unto sin. For the Holy Spirit of discipline will flee deceit and remove from thoughts that are without understanding and will not abide when unrighteousness cometh in. So it says, for the Holy Spirit of discipline will flee deceit. A lot of times we're caught up because we have no self-discipline. We cannot govern our behavior because we can't govern our thoughts. If you can't govern this, you won't govern anything else. You won't be to govern this, that down there, that right there. You cannot govern it until you learn to master your thoughts. You have to say, okay, my thought is saying this. I know it's evil. I'm not doing that based on these scriptures. But if the Bible is always closed, you don't have nothing to pull from. So uh, you're going to keep on doing the same thing until his Holy Spirit leaves you. Come on. And I'm going to go back to what you said, Bishop, back in uh, Psalms uh, 51. Okay. And that's the heart you asked for. Uh, that's what uh, David was asking for in the spirit. A clean heart. Something that's uh, a thought that is always with discipline. Where wisdom will meet you in every thought. This is an example. Ecclesiastes 23. 23, read verse 1. Ecclesiastes in the Apocrypha. Sirach, chapter 23. Verse 1. This right here is, this is a blessing to have. If you can have this type of mindset, we'll be all right until to the kingdom come, until Christ returns, if you have this type of mindset. And this is what we should ask for in our prayers. This is something what David asked for. Read this. O Lord, Father and Governor of all my whole life, uh -huh. leave me not to their counsels, and let me not fall by them. Mm -hmm. Who will set scourges over my thoughts? He was talking about God. He says, who will set scourges over my thoughts? What is a scourge? What is a scourge? Manasseh, what is a scourge? It's an instrument used to whip or to correct, right? That's the purpose of a scourge. It says, who will set scourges over my thoughts? Read on. Over my thoughts and the discipline of wisdom over my heart. And the discipline of wisdom over my heart, meaning my mind. The scourges that you're going to set over me are going to discipline my mind and what I thought, what I think. Read on. That they spare me not for my ignorance. So that way, when, you're, when you ever think an evil thought or a foolish thought, your mind having the discipline, it will what? Read again. Uh, let my uh, that they spare me not for my ignorances. That when you have that Holy Spirit, will not spare you not for your ignorances. It will it will correct you, and then when you have a disobedient thought, the Holy Spirit once again will meet you in every thought, and it will correct you. You will understand when you slip it, so you can correct it. Read on. And it passed not by my sins. And the thought that you have will not pass over your sins. That way, you won't end up in uh, committing presumptuous sins. You will be able to see your downfalls, downfalls and overcome them by the mindset you have. That's the clean heart. Read on. Verse 3. Uh -huh. Let my ignorances increase. Let and, read on. And my no, sins. No, read again, read again. Oh, lest my ignorances increase. Lest my ignorance shall increase. The way to prevent your, ignorances for, uh, your ignorance for increasing is have that mind of discipline. That will set scourges over your thoughts. And it only comes from one place. Asking it from the Lord. 
Read on. And my sins abound to my destruction. That, that way it prevent my sins from abounding unto my destruction. Read on. And my sins abound to my destruction, and I fall before my adversaries. Because if you don't overcome those things, this is what will happen. Read it again. And my sins abound to my destruction, and I fall before my adversaries. Meaning everybody that thought you was wrong in the first place and believe in what you believe in, they see your fall, now they got something to mark at you. See, I knew you wouldn't about that Israelite stuff. Look at you now. I thought this was the way. You told me that I was an Israelite. Look at you now. That's why uh, this is the spirit that asked for. He said, set scourges over my mind. That way I don't have the evil. I won't give the evil person nothing to say against me. Because I have stunned in the day of evil. I stood, I stood in the day of evil, done all that I could do. Read on. And I fall before my adversaries, uh -huh. and my enemy rejoice over me. Because that's what this world wants. For them, for you to fall, and them for, to rejoice over you. Okay, read on. Whose hope is far from thy mercy. Because their hope is far from your mercy. That's why you're supposed to ask for this heart, that you may grow thereby into the fullness and the stature of Christ. That's the clean heart. Everybody understand? Read that verse again. That was a good person. Verse 3, lest my ignorances increase, and my sins abound to my destruction, and I fall before my adversaries, and my enemy rejoice over me, whose hope is far from thy mercy. That's it. So I understand, that was a very good precept. The scourge of your thoughts. That means we have a mind, that means you have a mind, you have a conscience. And something is firing off and you try to give you, the, the Lord is long-suffering, merciful. He gives us chance and chance again to get it right. We just got to keep on denying it to the point he's like, you leave me nothing to work with. So many of us go through that. We have consciences and we know right from wrong. The point is, who's governing us? What are the choices that we're going to make? And the choices that we make, do you understand, is repercussions, some good and some bad. Let's go to Sirach, say the book of Sirach, and we're going to come back to where it was at. Sirach uh, 7, verse 36. Sirach 36. In the Apocrypha, chapter 7, verse 36. Whatsoever thou takest in hand, remember the end, and thou shalt never do amiss. Whatever you take in hand to do, remember the end, and you'll never make a mistake. What does that say about a person? Brothers, what is it saying about a person that says, whatever you choose to do, think of the end result and you'll never make a mistake. What, what characteristic does that person have? Yeah, it's called an answer. The question is what characteristic he has? Yes. He has a disciplined heart. Very good. He's disciplined. He's not easily moved. He doesn't make the decisions on a whim or just effect. He thinks before he moves. That's how you have control. When you're able to say, you know what? Let me think before I react. How many of your brothers in jail right now from being rash and not thinking? Right. Quick flop it. You know, kill somebody because they said something to you. Now you sit in jail for the next 20 years because a dude said, F you. you stepped on my sneaker. Looked at you the wrong way. <laughs> We, uh, uh, I was over at Captain Romney's house. We just watched a video on World Star of where nobody had any thoughts. Seven or eight black women jumped one pregnant woman. Oh, shit. <laughs> 
Oh shit. That bitch said a baby. Nobody was thinking that if you beat her up and you kill the baby at the same time, all y'all going to jail for murder. It'd be too no murder. thoughts. You kill her when we get double murder. Double murder. There was no thoughts there at all. He that think of the end shall never do a mist. All right. Let's go back. When's the last thing I had you hold? Psalms. Back in Psalms. Oh, yeah. Samuel 2. Yeah, we're at 1 Samuel 16, 14. Oh yeah, he took, okay, let's, let's go back to Psalms. Uh, no, Wisdom of Solomon. Oh. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 5. For the Holy Spirit of discipline will flee deceit. A deceitful man, that Holy Spirit will flee you. It will leave you. That Holy Spirit is supposed to discipline you. Read on. And remove from thoughts that are without understanding. And remove from thoughts that are without understanding. Wisdom and will not abide when unrighteousness cometh in. God said He would not abide, His Spirit would not abide when unrighteousness cometh in. For wisdom is a loving spirit and will okay. not. Hold this, First Chronicles 15 1 and 2. Yeah. First Chronicles chapter 15, verse 1. And David made him houses in the city of David. And prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched it. First Chronicles 15? Yeah, that's what I meant. I'm sorry, Second Chronicles 15. Second Chronicles chapter 15, verse 1. And the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded. And when he went out to meet Asa and said unto him, Hear ye me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while you be with him. It says the Lord is with you while you be with him. Read on. And if you seek him, he will be found of you. And if you seek him, how do you seek God? Right here, the Bible. That's how you seek him. He can be found. Read on. But if you forsake him. But if you don't seek God. You know what I mean? That's what I told you. The direct connect to sinning is the Bible being closed. If, but if you forsake him. He will forsake you. God said he will forsake you. Everybody understand that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. If you're ashamed of him, he will be ashamed of you. If you forsake him, he will forsake you. If you hate him, he will hate you. I know church touch you. He's going to love you, just love you, love you. That's not true. God said, I love them that love me. So we all come to a point where we got to start saying, who are we? What do we want out of life? What do we want to be known as? And that's something, that's a personal conversation you're going to have with yourself. It's going to be wrapped up in your own thoughts. What you're going to do. Psalm 73. Drop everything, Psalm 73. The book of Psalms, chapter 73, one. verse 1. The book of Psalms, chapter 73, verse 1. Truly God is good to Israel. Even to such as are of a clean heart. He's good to Israel, but indeed to such that have a clean heart. That has a clean mind. Read on. Yep. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. He says, but as for me, my feet were almost gone. My step had well nigh slipped. He said, I almost fell. God is good to them that have a clean heart. But he said, I almost fell. Read on. For I was envious at the foolish. And that was his problem because he envied what the foolish were doing. When I saw the prosperity of the wicked. When I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And that's many people, you, you, oh, people envy the oppressors. They see, I'm talking for you young kids now, for the young ones. Listen up, the ones in school, you young ones. Many of you spend, and I always say this, you spend so much time in school and dealing with the world system, learning from school. And you have peer pressure around you. A lot of peer pressure. Everybody's doing one thing and you're different. You got these shirts with these things hanging from it. Your sisters, you're wearing long dresses every day. 
Some of you go to school with head coverings on, and the rest of school, the dudes in there, well, I don't know how you would want to dress like them anyway, they dudes walk on skinny jeans, like gay, but whatever. But the point is, the whole world is doing one thing, and you gotta be careful. Because once you feel like you envy or you desire what they're doing to be like them or fit in, your foot is starting to slip. Your foot is starting to slip. We are set apart people. We're not to look like everybody else. We don't want to be involved with everybody else. We want everybody else to be involved in our world, not us in their world. We're trying to fit in. We hold back our conversation. You know, I was talking to somebody the other day and they said, uh, well, I heard it many times before, but he was saying, you can tell a brother sometime what they're about. Say, so get around people they know. And see if the word of God was being taught. Because if you do it, you'll know the person you're talking to have it. Sometimes we won't talk about God with certain people because we either envy what they're doing, we don't want to offend them. Our job as Israelites, our lifestyle is an offensive lifestyle to the ungodly. That's what we're ashamed. Yeah, oh, we're ashamed. Yeah. Say that wrong, sis. Judah. Say, oh, we're ashamed, which is a dangerous spirit to have, and it's true. But to be ashamed, we stand stiffly for this. I shot my Israelite for the tribe of Benedict. I always stand in my back in the For the greatest title I could ever have was to be called an Israelite. I'll make you ashamed now. I will, I will make you ashamed. But the point I want to say is that, um, back to the point, was that um, it says his foot and I slipped because he envied the foolish. Be mindful. Those things for you young ones. You're in school and you deal with people all day. I know a lot of us from adults, we you know, we have a different perspective because we've been living longer, so it's easier. It should be for many of us. Some of us, still, they struggle with that because they just love their mama and their best friend from high school and they're on a football team and, you know, whatever it might be. Basketball team, wrestling team, whatever it might be, cousin. And we feel like we're losing something now. You gotta understand, you're not really losing something, you're gaining something. So it says, we're clear, it says, start from verse um, one again. Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped, for I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. When I saw the prosperity of the wicked, that's when his foot almost nigh slipped. Now, where does this begin? Where does this whole thing start? Where is envy concocted from? Where's envy? Where does envy come from? Come. Right, but where, where does it? Where does it um, start? Manifest itself. Mind. Your mind, your thoughts. That's why I said to you before. We have to ask the Lord, what what is governing you? What is governing our thought process? Do we envy? or miss something that we're missing out at? Do we walk around amongst each other and really try to apply? Now I understand in scripture says the thought of foolishness is sin, but do we allow those things to govern our patterns? Because if it is, if it does govern your thoughts, it will govern your behavior eventually. So you want to pull? Okay, let's go from that, Isaiah, Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40 verse, bear with me one second, 27. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 27. Why sayest, why sayest thou, thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel? My way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God. Why do Israel think that their way is passed from the Lord or hid from the Lord? You know, you understand something that a lot of times we do that because we're worrying how one of us, how each other look at us. We believe that God doesn't see our actions. And Israel always had that mind. So read that again. Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel? My way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God. You think the judgment is passed by because you sin against God and then judgment doesn't pass right away? You think God is not going to judge you? You know who has a mind like that? Somebody who don't fear God. Somebody who don't study and don't believe in God. God said every 
that man shall speak shall give account of in the day of judgment. The books will be open for all of us, and we're going to have to answer for our actions. But we, because sometimes judgment is not passing right away, we just think that hey, God just let it pass by. No, don't, don't for a second think He let it pass by. He just hasn't dealt with you yet. We you don't. Know? Verse 28. Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He says, listen, don't you understand that God doesn't get tired? He's not going to forget. And there's no searching of his understanding. So you're trying to understand or think that you're getting away. God, he's like, you're an idiot. I made the reason, I made your mind that you think with. I'm going to get you eventually. I'm going to get you. So it behooves us before that time comes for us to what? Create in us a clean heart. Get our mind right. He's given us the opportunity. He's given, right now, he's given us the opportunity right now. As you hear these scriptures come out, time for you to figure it out. Figure it out. Or continue to do it your way. Let's see how it works out for you. Or me or whoever it might be. We don't. Verse 29, he giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Read. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young man shall utterly fall. So he giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. So to know, how does he give power to the faint? What? And to them that have no might, he increases strength. How does he give power to the faint? Remember we read earlier, my foot nigh slipped. Remember we read, he said, create in me a clean heart. How does he give power to the faint? Somebody just answer. Well, okay, something else. Yeah, back. By study. By study, he gives you, he's giving you opportunity. He'll give you, he'll give you strength to endure. There's no sin that comes to us that's uncommon to man. There's nothing you're going through that's just, I'm the only one going through it. You can't <coughs> please. I don't care what sin you're talking about. He gives power to the faith. He'll strengthen you if you want to. Give me James one word to talk about the word. That's it. Um, acts of him liberally. That's yeah. it, right? James 1. Yeah. Let me see your Bible. Right. Thank you. James chapter 1, verse 5. That's it, that's it. If any of you lack wisdom. If any of us lack wisdom. Let him ask of God. Let him ask of God. Read on. That give it to all men liberally. He'll give to every man as you want. Read on. And upbraid it not. And he's not going to upbraid you. So he gives to every man liberally. <coughs> if you study a little, guess what you're going to get? Little wisdom. You don't study at all, get some of his wisdom you'll get. No wisdom. You study a lot, what you're going to get? A lot of wisdom. And this Bible ain't that hard to understand what he's saying. What you put into is what you're going to get out of it. So he gives strength to the faint. There's something else I was thinking about when I said that. Uh, remember it says, and my, my wisdom strengthened my memory, the second Ezra, the seventh, seventh chapter, is it? Yeah. 18th verse. Yeah, drop that, hold what you had in Isaiah, and just give me that one. And he poured something in his cup. Mm -hmm. Give me the verse before the memory. Second Ezra chapter. 730. Nine. I forgot. The second Ezra. Yeah. 14. Uh, Second is 14? 14. 14. 14. Is the 14th chapter? Yeah, 14. Second is the 14th chapter. What verse? 39, 40, 39, 40. 40. Can I read it? Second Ezra's chapter 14, verse 39. Second Ezra's chapter 14, verse 39. Then opened I my mouth, and behold, he reached me a full cup, which was full as it were with water. But the color of it was like fire. He, he, the, the, the dream that Ezra was having was he was going to be, he's being, the, the analogy was he's being fed with wisdom. Read on. And I took it and drank. And when I had drunk of it, my heart uttered understanding. And when I took it wisdom, now I have understanding. I took it wisdom, now I know how to conduct myself. I know what to say, when to say it. How to deal. Read on. And wisdom grew in my breast. And wisdom now grew in my breast. Read on. For my spirit strengthened. And, and when it says in my breast, it means in his heart. And his heart is referring to his what? 
his mind. He said, wisdom now is growing in my mind. Read on. For my spirit strengthened my memory. Now my spirit that's on me have now strengthened my memory. So sometimes you can you can directly correlate why don't you know scriptures? Because you don't have wisdom. You should get to a certain point where you memorize some scriptures. You should have them beneath the belt. If you can't, I'm telling you, if you're this truth, and you've been this truth over a year, and you can't ex you cannot explain Deuteronomy 28, you better re-examine yourself because you're calling yourself an Israelite. And Deuteronomy 28 would be the chapter to explain why you call yourself an Israelite. And if you can't explain that, then you're in a cult. You're just following people because it sounds good. Because somebody said, you should to open at least Deuteronomy 28. No, no you can more than do 20. At least Deuteronomy 28 to explain who you are. Uh, you know, that's the bare minimum. And the 12 tribes, you should know the 12 tribes. Because you say you're part of it. I was like, so this is my mom in the picture. You don't know your mama's name. You know? So if, because I've had brothers before who, who did it, who's around for years and didn't know 12 tribes. I'm like, huh? and evidently the wisdom did not step in your memory. You were not drinking that cup. Your heart wasn't uttering understanding. You get to a certain point in truth that things are going to resonate in your spirit. It's going to become second nature. I'm telling you myself, I don't have the strongest memory. My memory's not strong like that. Uh, except if I'm in camp and you ask me a question, for some reason I can remember it. But sometimes when I'm sitting down, I, you know, I, I'll get it. Some people have stronger memories. But the point was that you just have to explain your faith, who you are. Why do you call the Caucasian man, the red man, why do you call him Esau? Whatever tribe, what tribe are you from? You can explain your tribe. All right, so let's go back to Isaiah 40. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28. Has thou not known, has thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young man shall utterly fall. It says, even indeed the youth shall faint and be weary, the young man shall utterly fall. Why? They don't think, we earlier, that they can get away with doing what they want to do and not judge. God said he'll take his spirit from them. He'll remove it. He'll give it to the faint. He'll give wisdom. And he'll take wisdom away from the youth and make them faint. That's why wisdom will not stay in you if you are not applying. I'm going to say this again. It's not like how you learn textbooks. One and one is two. You'll never forget that. But you won't forget who you are or how to explain it. I've seen it happen many a time before. People can't explain it. They would fire a teacher. Then you ask them some simple questions. What happened? They're starting to stumble now. They're stumbling. The spirit is starting to leave them. Read on. Verse 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. This is what? But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. But they that are patient, that are disciplined for the Lord, the Lord, he said, the Lord will renew their strength. Isn't that what David prayed for? Renew it to me. Help that me. Clean, clean heart. That clean heart. Thank you. <laughs> renew. He, God will renew you. So when you, I've been through this class before, you're going to get to a point where you might kind of level out in understanding. You get the basics in your belt. That's when you better start buckling down. That's when it gets dangerous then. When you start knowing a couple of scriptures because you think you know a couple of them. And I'm going to tell you, I've been there many a times. I've hit plateaus when I thought I knew. And I'm, trust me, I was just scraping the surface and hit that plateau. And then you better buckle down, double down, get deeper, because you get comfortable. There's no time to get comfortable in this truth. Our job is to grow to the measure and stature of Christ. It's an evolution from now to he returns or you drop dead. But it, you'll never reach that point on saying, I'm at that point now. I'm not there. I can tell you now there's things about I don't know. You're going to keep on perfecting your walk. But if you get a little stagnant stage, ah, uh, that's when it gets dangerous. You think you know a couple of scriptures? Trust me, you don't. 
You might know you are, but to, to really grow, it takes experience, and experience only come in time. That's what I watch with people, to be honest with you. I just watch, okay, you guys, let's see now if you're going to endure. Let's see if you can endure. Trials will come for each and every one of us, and we're going to see, are you going to apply these things? Let's read on, verse 31 again. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Right. They're going to soar. They won't faint. Those that renew their strength. Then the Lord said he will renew. Those that are patient, the Lord said, say it again. Got the definition for weary? Yeah, yeah. You got it? I got it. Read. Um, Merriam-Webster Dictionary, the word weary. It says bored or annoyed by something because you have seen it, heard it, done it many times or for a long time. Mm -hmm. That's, <laughs> That's why you can never go over these classes enough. Mm -hmm. Sometimes class be going over you're like, I, I, I've heard it before, I heard those precepts. I'm gonna tell you, I've reread the Bible so many times that every time I hear it, like sometimes I, I, I get, I, it happened today with something. Somebody said something in the class. And you keep on learning, and it's the same scripture that you keep on hearing, but a little more wisdom comes out of it. This word is ever evolving on how to apply it to your life. So when you ever get to a point where you think you've heard it all, you've learned it all, trust me, you ain't even. The day you say that is the day you just put a ceiling for yourself. Because I'm telling you, every time I go back and reread, I, I've always seen something different. I get a little more. You got something? Yeah. Um, Job. Job said that. That um, where we at? Job. What? Job chapter eleven. Yeah. I read it. That it's is a uh, you know measuring up to the statue of Christ, and you know Christ. Christ proved to us that we'll always be learning. Who came to Christ at night asking about repentance? Who was it, brothers? Nicodemus. Nicodemus. And Christ asked him, "Ain't you a ruler of the Jews?" You don't know what I'm talking about when it means to repent, be reborn. You don't understand this? That's a good scripture right there. This is why in Job chapter 11, verse 6. Job 11 and 6. And that he would show thee the secrets of wisdom. He would show thee the secrets of wisdom. That's what we ask for. That the Most High pours out his wisdom upon us like Solomon asked for. He prayed for wisdom and understanding to judge the people. We all, as prophets of God, should be praying for wisdom to give our people the right healing at the right time. Read on. That they are double to that which is. So that wisdom that you pray for, you pray just for the bare minimum to be able to explain Deuteronomy 28 <laughs> or lust or how to get off cigarettes, how to stop whoremongering. God said, I'll give you that wisdom, but just know it's double to what you already know. I got even more deeper levels over the same scriptures you're going to read over, but it's more to it than that. So it's an ever learning thing that we got to, so when you hit that plateau where you think, like, what do I study? Read it again. And ask yourself, how do I explain this in a different way? And you'll always be learning. you never get stagnant like that. And don't you do that, brothers that work out, don't you do that gym? You work out your chest? You're working out, you know, I'm doing, I'm doing sets, like, I, I don't feel like that no more. All right, still do it, just do it a different way now. Yep, yep. Do, do it, do the incline, the decline, whatever it might be. You're going to work out the same muscle, same thing with the Bible. You know, you read it this way, okay, now just read the Gospels. Okay, read it backwards this time. You know, <laughs> read upside down. <laughs> Learn another language. But continue taking it in because you don't realize you're putting more and more wisdom upon you, in your mind. And then one day you're going to need to extract that to come out on the other end of a situation. But if you think you know it all, that's when you really don't know nothing. Um, okay, let's go uh, from there to <coughs> Luke 14. Luke chapter 14, verse 28. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it. So who, who intends to build a building and don't count the cost? Do he have enough money to finish building? We know. Lest happily, after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, 
all that behold it began to mock him. You know something? Our lives. This is talking about us. When we signed on to this Israelite movement, repenting under our nationality, do you know you became the offskirts of friends and family? They look at you like you're crazy. How many of your family think you're in a cult? Think you're crazy? I ain't the whole movie raising that. Testify, Bishop. Testify. Nah, I'm going to tell you, I get some identified signs when you're a cult. One, you're stupid as hell. You don't have a mind to think. We ain't raising you all like that. We ain't raising you men and women. We want thinkers. That's right. And you follow me, you're stupid. You better follow what the scriptures say. That's right. First thing. And second, we're not fitting anybody any punch. Because <laughs> I ain't dying along with y'all. I hold your hand. Trust me, I ain't doing it. You all can drink it. I ain't drinking. I'm not thirsty. And, and if we are in a cult, we're in a cult called the cult that actually reads and does what the Bible says. <laughs> if, if, you got, if, if you got something like that, then yeah, I'm in that one too. <laughs> it, it, it boggles my mind because all we're really doing is just reading the Bible and actually applying what it says. Exactly. Y'all read the Bible and you go out your way not to apply what it says to the point where the pastors tell you if you keep the commandments, you're sinning. What well, the sin was breaking the commandments. You just lost me. You just lost <laughs> Who said that? Was that T.D. Jackson? No, said that? Creflo. 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 Creflo said, if you keep the commandments, you're actually sinning. <laughs> Look, and, uh, I, for, okay, I'm sorry, I'm digressing. Nobody I got digressing. I would love to be in that room right there because I said, uh, excuse me, I got a question. I got one after him. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, uh, Mr. Dollar? <laughs> Listen, I got Pastor Dollar. I have a question. <laughs> All right. I thought sin was to transgress. Somebody give me a precept, please, real quick. Now, read it loud. I thought sin would be transgressing the law, not keeping the law. But you have to, everybody in church is so stupid as hell. And look, I mean, God bless they dumb selves. I hope they get their minds right. But he just said, if you keep the commandments. Can somebody find me that video, please? I got to see it. You got to see it. I got to see it. It's, that's a phenomenon. I'm telling how Christianity. Christianity is a hell of a drug. Nobody got a mind to say, excuse me. So you're telling me if I keep God's commandments, I'm sinning. No, the Ten Commandments is sad. Yeah. The book of Luke chapter 14, verse 28. For which of you intend to build a tower, sit it not down first, and count it the cost, whether he has sufficient to finish it. Read. Least happily, after he have laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him. So now you begin to build a tower, but you don't, you, you don't have enough wherewithal to consider. Do I have sufficient? You come as truth. You don't really ask yourself, do you have sufficient to endure to the end? Meaning, are you ready to be corrected and take correction without be offended? Right. Are you willing, are you ready so whatever comes before you, that nothing will separate you from God, tribulations, death, nothing will separate you from the love of God. Because the minute you say you believe, the minute you sign on to say you're an Israelite, there's no looking back. You turn back, just like Lotwine, you turn it back, you're going to die. So now you sign up for this, and you get it, it sounds good, and then you get involved, and all of a sudden now, you're like, this is not for me. You done broke bread. You made a, you made a covenant agreement with God in Christ, and you turn back. Okay, let's see that. Hey, hit the light. Fallen from grace. You know we have heard that term a lot in in our time, when a preacher or some famous person, you know, does something. They say they fall from grace because of sin or some mishap. But now, according to the verse of Scripture, to fall from grace is not to fall into sin. In fact, when you, when you fall into sin, you fail into grace. <laughs> you see, that just, that, your tradition freaked out then, didn't it? When you fail into sin, grace captures you to let you know sin, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't fall from grace. You, you, you didn't move from grace. You, he, you, you were right there with grace. You know what he calls following in grace? Returning back to the law. Trying to keep the law that Jesus died so that you can be free from is a fall from grace. To fall from grace is to go back into the law 
and trying to keep it after what Jesus has done for you. Amen. And, you know, we talk about the ministration of death, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 7, ministration of condemnation. Um, Romans chapter 75, we talked about how the law stirs up sin. We looked at that. So if we Christians hope for victory over sin, we shouldn't have any relationship with the law, not even the Ten Commandments. If we should hope for victory over sin, we should not have any relationship with the law, which is over 600 of them, and also not, not even the Big Ten. <laughs> not even the Big Ten. Ooh, I know that's just freaking your tradition. Out. Not even the Big Ten. Because Jesus died to free me from the Big Ten. See, I try not to get excited because I want to pour it out on you so you can see this, but this is just amazing stuff. If, if we hang on to the law as our guide, we can expect sin, we can expect guilt, and you know what? We can expect confusion. Sin, guilt, a lot of confusion. The law is ineffective to save us. It's ineffective to grow us up. The law is just plain ineffective for believers, as we saw in Hebrews 7 and, and verse 18. It's ineffective for believers. We have no practical, everyday use for it as a guide in our lives as Christians. It is now, according to Hebrews 8, 13, the law is now today for us who have been declared righteous, obsolete. All right, now, let's deal with another perspective of the law then. So, uh, isn't the law good for something? Well, Jesus says something in Matthew chapter 5 that's so important for you to see. Isn't the law still good for something? Look at what he said. Matthew 5 verse 17 and verse 18 Look what Jesus said. He said in verse uh, 17, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill the law. For verily I say unto you, now look what he said about the law. Verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So the law is still around. Verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So the law is still around. Wait a minute. Wait, wait a minute. Hold, wait, first of all, you're not going to speed past that like you didn't just say what you just said. So the law is still around. What? So the law is still around. What? So the law is still around. Oh, damn.
But if the law doesn't help us Christians live upright lives, then what use is it? The law has a specific purpose on this side of the cross while it's still here. What? And while it shall not pass away, while heaven and earth, well, let me see, make sure I read that right. Verse uh, 18, till heaven and earth pass. Has heaven and earth passed? So the law still got to function here on this side of the cross. You know you don't f***ed up, right? No! I said, no. I said I pulled into the garage <laughs> at no, no, no. The, the... You know you don't f***ed up, right? No! I said, wait a minute. Not for us Christians, but it still has a function. What? Not for us Christians, but it still has a function. Hell no, to the no, no, no. Hell to the no, hell to the no, to the no, no, no. no. Let's go. Look, look, watch this. Put the mic over. Watch this. And when they get out of, put it up to my mouth. And when they get out of church, they feel like kids. Man, pastor's real. <laughs> right. <laughs> I just smoke this grace right now. I smoke this grace. And then you come back and say, this is what you're doing. You can't judge me. Exactly. 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 Alright, what's the scripture she quoted? 1 Corinthians 3rd chapter? 2 Corinthians 3. 3-7. So yeah, Romans chapter 7. Now, honestly, I don't, I don't remember what 2 Corinthians 3 or 7 had, but I guarantee you, it ain't saying what he's saying. 3 and 7, let's read it. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 7. But if the ministration of death written and engraved in stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. Now what does that have to do with what he was talking about? He said that was to be done away with. That was administration of death. Okay, now we're going to explain it. That has, okay, I want to tell you something. It's going to sound a little confusing. What he was saying was wrong. And why this is going to be confusing is because what, let me say a little differently, what he was saying was right. That's what I meant to say. Meaning, there are laws that are done away with that you don't have to keep. And if you do keep them, you're sinning. Right. And that's some of the sacrificial law. Right. That's what he wasn't explaining. He was being cracked. This is it says, curse the man that uses the word of God deceitfully. Yep. That's what he's doing. And we're going to explain it now. Yeah. Like I said, we don't run from the scripture. But where he went off the deep edge, if he would have stayed there, he could have played with God's words a little bit. He'd still be the devil. When he says, and if you keep the tennis, when I said, okay, he locked, cut it off. I don't listen to that. <laughs> Not that he's crazy. But if you would try to keep the sacrificial law, you would be in sin because you'd be adapted to the whole law. Meaning, you would have to go to Jerusalem three times a year. You would have to bring your animal, your offerings. You would have to find a Levite to sacrifice to God. And the temple's not even standing. So you have to go to Haiti, go get a Levite. He don't even know he's Levi. You gotta go to Jeremiah. You have to go to, uh, to, to Israel. This temple's not even there no more. They have to find the animal, you do it three times a year. That's the only way you could be keep the law in whole. You understand that? It's impossible to do it because the temple's not even there. So you have to lean on what now? Christ. Say it? Christ. Christ. So he's be he's slick, he is slick, but he's dumb as hell. Because he should have said the Ten Commandments. That's what he lost. Okay, so let's explain now. Uh let's go a little higher. Verse, uh, what verse he had you? Seven. Let's read six, five, three. I don't want to do so much. Let's start with six. Second Corinthians chapter three verse six. Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament. Start a little higher. Uh, this really for a bunch of verse three. Verse three. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us. Watch this. I'm gonna tell you something. Look how this Bible's written. Second Corinthians, the second chapter. Read the last verse. 
Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17. For we not, for we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. What does the Bible say? For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. Look how God have his word written. Notice he just pulled. Remember, when this Bible was written, when this letter was written in Corinth, it wasn't written in chapters. It was a letter written. Man put chapters in it. And the thought flowed from chapter 2 ending into 3. And the scripture he pulled was in chapter 3. And it just told you that we are not like many that use to corrupt the word of God. He's corrupting God's word to lead people into sin. So let's read that again. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God. In the sight of God, speak we in Christ. Right, we're going to speak in Christ. And to speak in Christ is to speak in the laws of God, because right. Christ is the word that was made flesh. You knew he was lying when he was up going, uh, uh, go. yeah. you know, he's he making up as he go. So let's just go back and explain it. Let's go, let's read straight on down. Verse 1, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 1. Do we begin again to commend ourselves, or need we, as some others, epistles of com commendation to you, or letters of commendation from you? So now Paul said, do we have to commend ourselves to you? Do you should know who we are by our works. Do we need letters to commend it? Read on. Ye are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. He said, but you are our epistles, meaning... Your lives are a testimony of the work that we have done. Right. We, read, we went into these lands and, like, to say, me giving all praise to the Most High, you are my epistles. I came here, there was nobody here. The Most High used me for his purpose, and this is what you see around you right now. Please don't take I'm taking as vain glory. I'm just trying to give you an example of what Paul was saying. I can show you who I am. Just look at the people that came. God moved them around. Read on. Verse 3, for as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us written not with ink but with the spirit of the living god not in tables of stone but in fleshly tables of the heart okay he says and it wasn't written in a table of stones and we're going to see what that stones was talking about but it's written in tables of hearts we're going to see in a second read on verse four and such trust have we through christ to god not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves but our sufficiency is of God. And he said, it's not for us to, by looking at you to think highly of ourselves, because we're nothing. But it's the sufficient of God for his purpose is why this is happening. Read on. Verse 6, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament. He said, and God has made us able ministers. Able to what? To defeat lies. That's right. Able ministers. That's why I said we don't run from no scripture. We run to quote, quote it and we'll read it. And pray a chance, I don't know it. I guarantee you, I say, somebody right here, you know, somebody get that verse. <laughs> give you, somebody will give you a verse for that. Read on. Not of the letter, but of the spirit. But, read it from the top. Who also have made us able ministers of the New Testament. Now, the New Testament is what? The New Agreement. He rules the eighth chapter, right? It says, and the New Testament is what? Not of the no, letter. No. What is the New Testament? Grace, grace. grace through Christ. Not, no longer sacrificing. Shall we read again? Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. Yeah, but not of the letter, but of the Spirit. You got it in Hebrews? Watch this. Romans, I'm sorry. Get it. It's the book of Romans, chapter 7, verse 6. Book of Romans, chapter 7, verse 6. It says, But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So watch this. But now we are delivered from the law. So it means we're delivered from not committing adultery. And so watch what it says. That being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the old, not in the oldness of the letter. So how do you serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter? The oldness of the letter meaning you would have had to go and sacrifice. The newness of the spirit is through Christ. Watch this. Read on. Romans. Yeah. Verse 7. What should we say then? Is the law sin? So now because we no longer, we're dead to the law, meaning the law of sacrifice, does that mean now the laws of God is sin? God forbid. No. Creflo is saying yes, sin. 
say no. That means you can't now go commit adultery. You can't steal. You can't murder. You can't have hatred towards your brother. He said that now, if that's the case, because we're under grace now, the laws are no good? No. Read on. God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. He said, I would have not known what I was doing, but by the law. I need the laws to explain to me that I was sinning. And the crazy thing about it, this is scripture what he was quoting. It says the law stirred up sin. This is the part he was quoting. But he didn't read the top of it. Is the law sin? God forbid. When he said the law stirred up sin, he was talking about the bottom part of verse 7. He didn't read it from the top. But again, he bedazzled the church. Um, it says, but by the law. For I had not known lust except the law had said, thou should not cover. He said, I wouldn't even know what lust was if it wasn't by the Ten Commandments. I this guy's an idiot. Uh, this guy's crazy. Read on. But sin, taken occasion by the commandment, brought in me all manner of uh, concupiscence, for without the law, sin was dead. But sin, taken occasion by the commandments, wrought or worked in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law, sin was dead. So without knowing the law, I didn't know I was sinning. Right. Mm -hmm. That's what he's saying. That was that to me before I came to truth. When I first came to truth, or well, before I came to truth, uh, somebody told me, so you know eating pork was wrong. I'm like, wrong? So yeah, you can't eat pork. So what are you talking about? It's in the Bible. I said, that's in the Bible? <laughs> I didn't know eating pork was wrong. I didn't even know pork was in the Bible. But when it was revealed to me, now what happened? Sin is revived now. Before sin was dead. I didn't know it was sin. Now it's revived. Now it's alive. Now I know from now I have a choice. Choose right from wrong. So so Creflo is saying that it's better to go on living your life in stupidity and wait on the judgment of God to come and kill you than to know and change. Yep. Yep. That's what he said. Just live your life in ignorance and just live it up. You cool. Read on. Verse eight, verse nine. Verse nine. I was, I was alive without the law once. He said, I was alive without the laws of God once. But when the, com when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. He said, but when the commandments came in, sin was awakened. Now I know, oh snap, if I look after women to lesser for her, I'm committing adultery. I thought if I just slept with a married woman, that was adultery. Right. God said, no. If you look at her to lust after her, now you commit adultery. Oh snap. Sin is revived in me now. Now I know I'm doing wrong. It says, sin revived and I died. What does it mean, I died? Meaning the old man now is being put to death. So he was alive once without the Lord, alive, living as a sinner. And the sin was revealed to him, and now the old man in him is being put to death. I'm telling you something, I can guarantee you, church, I, I know that there's no way they can get through this chapter. No way. No way. The book of Romans, period. The book of, they couldn't, they couldn't begin. They, this, this is way, way, way over their head. If you tell me that you, you break the Ten Commandments and it's okay, I know. Just come, let's, let's begin. I don't know. He's so far gone. First, you got to figure out Deuteronomy 20. Somebody explain that to him. Verse 10. Ah, oh, this took me off the whole class. Yeah, go ahead. Verse 10. The commandment. Ah, that was it. Let's go. Let's stop. That's a good thing. No, I'm flustered. I don't want to talk about it. I forgot. Where was I at? Oh, give me Luke 14. Yeah, that's what it was. Back to our regular schedule program. Next, hey, next week, we'll go. Hey, Jim, you need to teach that class. Uh, Romans. I'm sorry. I mean, Psalms, Psalms 111, verse 10. So let's read that real quick. <laughs> Psalms chapter 111, verse 10. Hey, that little clip just frazzled dazzled me just now. <laughs> <laughs> that thing, that just frazzled dazzled me. It threw me all off the back. I, I, I'm over here thinking, I just can't imagine. Thank the, I thank the Father that he bestowed wisdom upon me. Oh, praise. I wouldn't even have been to church. I wouldn't have been that stupid. I, I'd have been wicked and stupid. I wouldn't have been to church. I knew better than that. Psalm. I feel, so, I'm sorry, I'm I feel sorry for people that go to church. 
Our job, our job, man, is to get them up out them whole houses. That's right. That's our job. Renew their minds. Because, and I can understand why the young youth on the street don't even believe in the Bible. And because you hear men like this running game, driving around with a $65 million jet, where are you going that you just couldn't catch a, a jet blue or delta? And take that 60, 65 million right and build establishments in the congregation for people in housing and doc hospitals and whatever jobs. jobs. Yeah, listen, ain't nothing you could you could get. Listen, you could fly around all year. You know what? You buy. I'm sorry, I'm venting. Christianity is the devil. You buy a 65, a 65 million dollar jet. You know how many millions of dollars a year it takes to maintain it? I'm not talking about fuel. I'm talking about just to maintain the jet. The money you spent on fuel, the money you got spent on staff, just to run that thing. Check. Unless you unless unless you have a commercial, unless you just have a flying people around and you making money on it, you just gotta sit there flying. Where are you flying every week? Are you serious that you couldn't jump on a regular flight like anybody else? Christ rode at the town on a donkey. Mm. You didn't come on a flipping stallion. You're a thief. And you people are stupid that go to church to give that man the Shepherd feeds the flock, not the flock feed the shepherd. Psalms chapter 111 verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You want wisdom? The beginning of wisdom is you must fear God. You fear his judgment. You fear the repercussions for breaking the law. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. So you want a good understanding what the Bible say? Do his commandments. If you don't do his commandments, you don't have a good understanding. That's why I said sometimes on the streets, when I deal with, I'd rather deal with the thugs on the corner selling crack than deal with these church people that think they know the Bible. Because they think they know, and they got all these precepts, but they ain't got all these precepts. But they be so far off the map. The Bible says you will not have a good understanding unless you're keeping the commandments. So I don't care who it is, I don't care how good they sound, if they're not keeping the commandments, it's impossible with God for them to know the Bible. So you men on the street don't ever get bedazzled by somebody coming, I'm a black, I'm a bishop, I'm an evangelist, I'm the, whatever they call themselves, I'm the Pope, whatever, come, come hither. <laughs> Beat you across the head with these scriptures. I'm like, I'll be listening, yeah, so, so go ahead and talk, let me hear what you got to say. I would, I would love to run a Creflo corner on the street. You ain't gonna find him on the street. <laughs> yeah, they went in front of the church and he called the police on him in Orlando. Yeah, 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 they called the police on him. They ran him up in front of the church. He, and they was across the street from his church and he got the police to come and run him off, run them off the corners. Oh, we weren't looking for him already. Don't worry, we weren't looking for Creflo. Go ahead, read on. Let's go back to Luke 60. So I hope we understand that, uh, Luke, uh, Luke 14. If you don't keep the commandments, no, I don't care who you are, me, whoever. If you don't keep the commandments, you do not understand the Bible. 14, 28. Yeah. Luke chapter 14, verse 28. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Do you have sufficient to finish this race that you're in? This race is not for the swift. This is a longevity race. <coughs> you young ones, all of us, we are in this to the end. I would pray to Christ's return or, or we die. Do you have sufficient to run this race? Or are you going to get offended? You're not going to like something that's said. You don't want to change your ways. Because if you don't, people are going to begin to mock you. Remember, many of you went home to your families and professed that you're from the tribe of Judah and all this stuff, right? And they're laughing at you. Now you go back and you find yourself back in the world. Trust me, the day you go back, they won't say anything. They'll be quiet. To just serve you there, I'll serve you at Thanksgiving pray. And while you eat it, that's it, that's it. Look at it. I told you, see, I told you about that Bible stuff, that Bible. Don't worry, baby, go ahead and have that dinner. We love you. And they're going to laugh and mock to your face. And the reason why, because they got the victory, like they're, they're back. I tell you, that, that Israel stuff was a joke. It's not real. Somebody told me that when I first came to truth. I said, it wasn't a fad, it was a friend of mine. I said, no way, he's not going to do it. It's just a, it's just a fad. Yeah, sure. Read on. Verse 29. Let's happily, let's happily, let's happily, after he have laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him. Right, you started, let me tell you something. I'm going to get another story. I know somebody who came up in the truth and I saw him 
uh, when I was in New York last year. My brother owns a catering hall. So I'm in the catering hall working. And I, they was having parties that night. So I'm standing back. And the brother was mighty the word. I see him walking in there with his pants. This is he been this guy would have been around 15 years ago. So he walks and he don't even notice me. I just see him. He got some whore on his arm, walking with his pants, sagging, looking like one of these little rappers. And I'm looking at him, and I'm just laughing. I said, this guy didn't have what it was to finish this race. He walked, he walked right past me, didn't even notice who I was. I looked at him and said, boy, you gave up the ghost. Ran him, started running this race, and he was on fire when he first came in. And didn't have it. Read on. Verse 30, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000. So what is it telling you that if you're going out to war, and it's truth, but you go out, each, every one of us, when we, when we confess that we the Israelites, we are at war with this world. And so who doesn't count the cost to realize that you're going to be outnumbered. You go to war with 10,000 and they come with 20,000. You're going to be that one child in school against all the other people out there that's not doing it. And you got to be, are, are you the one that's built for this? Or are you going to start that war and they go, I want to fit in. I want to make peace. We're not about making peace for people. When I say that, I don't mean having controversy with people. I mean that we're going to trip all ways to try to fit in with people. So read that verse again. Verse 30, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000. So you better, which king doesn't sit down? You better count the cost. Or do you have what it is to fight this battle? And if you don't, then you better buckle down, get your mind right before you go out there and embarrass yourself. Read on. Verse 32. Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. And before, you, the, before the fight even get thick, you are in what? Trimming your ways. Because you're worried about what they might think or what they might do. They might fire me. Are you prepared for this battle? Read on. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. I hope everybody understand what they signed in for. You better wrap. You better wrap your choice about life choices that you're going to make. What you signed up for? Because the scripture says, "So likewise, whosoever what that for whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not uh, forsaketh not all that he had, he cannot be my disciple." And trust in each and every one of our lives, we're going to have to live through this. We're going to have to have the mind that we're willing to let go of every and any one that's not about this truth. Now I know it sounds like words on the page, but it comes to life in many of our lives, and it's going to be in all of our lives eventually. You will not be, so have you count the cost yet? To make life choices like that, you have to be of a, a strong resolve. You gotta really believe in this truth. And then when you do, and some of us don't have no problem forsaking families. But then we forsake our families, we let them go, we're like, we're not dealing with them, and then we get offended about corrections like that. And then you find yourself running back to them. Did you count the cost? Right, I got a couple more scriptures. James chapter 4 verse 8 draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you so in these life choices that you're making draw nigh to God the way you draw nigh is to apply to study draw nigh to God and he's going to draw nigh to you he's going to increase you in understanding read on cleanse your hands ye sinners and purify your hearts ye double minded it's a cleanse your hands you sinners get yourself right and purify 
purify your heart and get your thoughts right. That's why I said earlier before that sometimes what you see on the eye side of a person is not what's really going on with them. There's something else going on with them on the inside. And it's not for us to judge because we can't see each other's thoughts. But for that person, he better cleanse his thoughts. You a double-minded person, be careful. Double-minded mean that you're going two ways. There's two different things governing you. And after a while, God is like, listen, I'm not sharing space with Satan. Satan, you can have him. I'm out. You're on your own. So it's in your best, in your best interest to do what? Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh unto you. Draw, and he's going to draw closer. Study, and he's going to give you understanding. Ask, and he will answer you. It says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Something you want? Isaiah, I know. Psalms 50, uh, Proverbs 15. I'm going to wrap it up in a couple of scriptures. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 31. Yeah. The ear that heareth the reproof of life abideth among the wise. Yeah, the, the ear that heareth the reproof of life will abide amongst the wise. The, the ear that, the man or woman that has an ear that can hear correction will abide among the wise. Read on. Verse 32. He that refuseth instruction despiseth his own soul. But he that heareth reproof, get it, understanding. Some people, some people have that mind where they hate to be told, they hate to be corrected. We gotta have this. Remember it says, smite me and it shall be kindness. When we have the mind where we hate to be told, we, we, uh, we, take, it, we take it personal. That's, that's what this job is about. We're each other's keepers. We watch out for each other's souls. You see, if any of you saw, see me in error, it's your, it's your responsibility and duty to correct me so I can get right and vice versa. But when we have a problem when we can't, tell, we can't be told something, or you have, if you find it in your spirit, you at that crossroads where you gotta make a life choice. Am I gonna take correction and realize that it's love? Or am I gonna have, or am I gonna spot, what is it again, this, this whole chapter? Yeah. 32, isn't it? Yeah, that's it. Verse 32. He that refuseth instruction despiseth his own soul, but he that heareth reproof getteth understanding. But he what? Getteth understanding. But he that heareth what? Reproof getteth understanding. But that person that can hear the reproof will get understanding. Take that so they can, they're able to take that correction. I tell you, you find a lot, you, you find a lot with young souls that they haven't processed yet that this is about business. Uh, you hear him say, you hear him say, I heard him say, brother used to tell me years ago, he said, uh, you come tell, bring, bring to me, I, I love correction. As soon as I brought to the <laughs> he, he lost focus that this is a job, this is for the kingdom. The spirit couldn't take it. And you got some people who like that. They just, they cannot take it. They cannot take that correct. It bothers their spirit. Ah, we don't. Verse 33. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom. And before honor is humility. And when you fear the Lord is the instruction of wisdom. And before any honor, you must be able to humble yourselves down. You must be able to take correction. Why? Why do a people have problems with that? Proverbs 30, we're going to wrap it up. 30 verse 12. Proverbs chapter 30. There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes, and yet is not washed from their filthiness. And that's the reason why. There's a generation of people that's pure in their own eyes. They can't see what they're doing wrong. And thus, they can never be washed from their filthiness. They can never see what they're doing wrong. And when you're wise in your own wise, in your own eyes, it's dangerous. We cannot be around each other week in, week out, and there's no checks and balances. How many times, how many times have you all heard me say, I don't trust my own thoughts? There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Isaac. One man. Thank you. Isaac's the only one that be paying attention to class. Thank you, Isaac. 
official. That's what I'm calling him now. He's got the moments. How many times? <laughs> Good job, Isaac. It says that yeah. time. Proverbs 16. It says, yeah. right. it says that back in Proverbs 16, 25. Not to trust your thoughts. Yeah. You want to read it? Yeah, Isaac, don't go home with that because you'll get in trouble. I'm just joking. I'm going home try I told you, watch. I got to <laughs> <laughs> cut that tail. <laughs> he gonna wake him up in the morning and ask to see his notes. <laughs> yeah. Let me help you out. I take that back. Okay, good. What? Read it again. Uh, Proverbs chapter thirty, verse twelve. There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes, right. and yet is not washed from their filthiness. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's it. Pure in their own eyes. They can't see it. All right. Let's wrap it up. Um, uh, 14. Uh, Proverbs 14. Yeah, I should stay on. I still Christianity. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, and that's dangerous. We do we do the same thing over and over again. But there's a way that seemeth right unto a man. But the end thereof are the ways of death. Life choices. So you can either do it your way. Or take the multiple counsel and be careful. But it says, there's a way that seemeth right unto a man. Meaning, your mind might be thinking that you're making sense. I always tell the young brothers, I said, by default, y'all don't know that. And that's not your fault. You just don't know. Just listen. Just listen. You're going, you're going, it's, it's, you're going to make mistakes, I guarantee, because you just don't have the experience. Right. But sometimes you got some self willed people that's so self I know what I'm, all right, okay. Yeah, every time I see brothers doing that, like, watch them fall apart, fall away, year two down the line, it can't be told. But if any of you have, if any, if any of us, say any of you, any of us have that spirit where we have a problem with correction, we cannot be circumspect, we can't examine ourselves, be careful. You're going to make wrong life choices. I'm Elder Nathaniel, Israel United in Christ. YouTube likes to shut our channels down, as some of you have noticed, <laughs> ever so often. Subscribing to join IUIC will assure you will always stay connected to our YouTube accounts. We want to do our best to make sure this truth gets up. Please click and join our subscriber YouTube channel called Join IUIC to stay linked to all of our videos. So again, please make sure you subscribe to this Join IUIC channel to get your latest updates on all our YouTube channels. Shalom.